Hey guys, it's Pineapple, and today I want to switch it up a little bit and do a Q&A style video, because after asking on Twitter, I did manage to get a lot of questions and a lot of interesting ones, so let's see if I can give you guys some interesting replies. Now, if you would like to submit questions for the next Q&A, we can do like a YouTube comment section one. You could just submit them in the comment section for this video, and of course, I'll compile those, and we'll do it again. This time I asked people to just pretty much ask me any question they wanted about a take that I have on My Hero Academia or a prediction or a theory or anything like that. So you can do the same for the next one. Just comment below and next time you'll see if your question gets used. All right, so let's get started. What's your favorite theory out there and which do you believe the most? Uh, I think it would probably have to be the weird grandma evil theory. There's a theory on Twitter you can find on like a uh, at Mawari or it, it's something like that on Twitter, but it's just kind of around here and there. And it's it's about like secretly there being an old lady in control of everything that's happened in the story so far. And she's getting away with all of it and no one suspects anything. I think in actuality, it's a theory that the old lady that raised Dobby and the one that ignored Tenko are all the same and she's malicious as hell, which I just think is a hilarious since it's probably just a random pair of grannies, but My Hero is the kind of series where you generally might have to watch out for a dangerous grandma arc, so that one always kind of struck me as fun. As for the one I believe in the most, aside for any theory that I've had confirmed since I first started making theories, I'd probably say the dad for one theory, and I, I know, just right there, everybody clicked off the video. Are you a granny evil believer? Rewind, like, one minute. How do you want the finale battle between Deku to play out? Between Deku, huh? For example, do you want it to be multi-stage where they fight in reality, in the one for all realm with their vestiges, and then back in reality? Or do you want it to be class 1A team effort in the second half and Deku only first half, and then Deku and Shigaraki? Okay, so uh, how do I see the finale battle between Deku and Shigaraki playing out? Well, I definitely envision it uh, starting as a team battle with everyone trying to counter Shigaraki's quirks with the help of Deku and Momo shouting out commands and planning from beforehand a bit to try and work out some sort of effective strategy for revealing any potential weaknesses that Shigaraki might have. All Deku can really do to a certain extent is wear Shigaraki down as much as possible until some sort of weakness makes itself known. And I think that Deku has a clue that All for One and Shigaraki's relationship is flawed and that there might be something in there that he could use to create a moment that could be useful in somehow saving Shigaraki from All for One. But I'm crossed on how exactly I think it'll unfold in stages because it really depends on whether or not the living, breathing All for One is still around and if he's involved in the final fight, right? Like, because it, if he is, it kind of complicates everything in a great way because they have to take down the vestige in Shigaraki's head somehow and also take down the real living guy while also somehow dealing with Shigaraki himself themselves, I think it's really complicated with Shigaraki slash All for One for now. But like I've been saying a little on Twitter, I'm gonna just default to calling whatever new entity they're becoming uh, Tenko, unless he has a better name for himself next chapter. With the live action My Hero Academia movie announced, what do you wanna see in it? How much do you think they should cover in the first movie? I think I have a video on this exact topic and my opinion hasn't really changed. Uh, I think instead of making the first movie about Deku and the UA kids, they should start the movie universe from step one and tell All Might's full story from getting his power to his time in America, which obviously works really well since it's an American movie and probably a lot of the locations it would use are gonna be in America. But I mean, since we haven't really seen all of All Might's time there, it would be nice to see that in a film. Giving All Might a trilogy and then developing other heroes like Endeavor in his own movie would kind of start to work in characters from Class 1A, and I think it would be a really smart way to build the franchise around All Might in the same way that the MCU was kind of initially built around Tony Stark, right? Like, and that way when you have characters who are directly tied to him like Deku was later on, it becomes natural that his story needs to be told, and I think audiences would obviously be excited to start his story after having All Might's told, especially considering the parts that All Might still has to play, like in USJ or Kamino. I think it would be like an Avengers-level event to have all Might step back into the ring, and I particularly think that they could make Kamino into its own whole kind of movie. That would be really awesome. Toho gives you the choice to replace Studio Bones as MHA's studio. Who you picking? I wouldn't change the studio, I would change the sub-studio and move it to a team that handles projects on like a longer time scale. I mean, I love shows like Kekai Sensen or Mob, but obviously they take way longer to make, and MHA is produced on a different time scale, likely because they have to keep pumping out anime to keep it relevant. I mean, at a minimum for the sake of the merch, manga volumes, and business collaboration sales that I'm sure are fueled by quick and frequent releases. And I guess that puts us in a complicated place because MHA can't really take too long to come out, and it can't come out too quickly and be rushed, but making a production longer isn't always a solution to a problem if the people who you want to work on something 
aren't available at all, or you aren't open-minded enough to allow the people who are available to work on your production to have the leeway and the creative control to a certain extent to provide you work that is interesting and can meet the timeline. So I think a lot goes into it, and I could just say that, hey, I'll give MHA to MAPPA, and we probably get a really, really pretty, shiny, edgy MHA adaption, but at the same time, you have to kind of balance how much you want something to look nice and the reality that someone is out there slaving away to make that happen, right? So there's not really like a quick and easy solution, which are the kinds that I personally like. So I guess just moving it to another Bone Studio and just loosening their guidelines a bit while giving them more time to release would be my answer. But is that too idealistic? Like, is that possible? Or would I just kill the series like that somehow? I'm glad it's not my decision and I can just complain about it for free. Do you think that MHA lately has been focusing on the side characters too much and not so much on Deku? Uh, no. No, we just had a Deku solo arc, and even though I think that wasn't long enough, I do believe tying the side characters and civilians into the story is really important. Because in a big way, for most of his life, Deku was one of those people. He's only recently received main character status in his own life, but this whole time outside of that, he's been on the sidelines watching people just like all the side characters were. So I think he knows more than anyone else what it's like to be them just watching from the sides while his peers were already learning about their quirks. And since I think of Deku as being the civilian who made it, sort of, I think working the civilians in more is fine, because just like how Deku was apparently a powerless civilian who became a hero, they can all do the same thing, because he was never truly powerless. By wanting to save people more than anyone else, he did gain a power that enabled him to literally become a hero and do that, but it also enabled him to create a path for everyone to follow his example instead of All Might's as a symbol of not just peace, but I honestly think as the symbol of unity. I think because of Deku's efforts and, you know, all the lessons that he's taught everyone in the class and everything that he's learned and how that spread, which I guess we'll talk about later in another answer, the next person who wants to save someone who's quirkless might not have to go through the complicated trouble of getting a one for all, right? They might just be able to get help from somebody else. Or the next kid that faces a situation like Tenko or Overhaul might not have to get, you know, kind of ignored by random people on the street and then end up with a dark overlord. Do you think Deku will ever learn muscle form like All Might? Did other users have a muscle form? What is muscle form's relation to one for all anyway? I think muscle form is more of a visual gag. The way that it's explained in the manga about being like when a guy puffs up his chest kind of plays it off like a gag and it is sort of odd that he can just inflate himself with the power of one for all and give himself muscles, especially since my hero is the kind of universe where becoming all serious looking could kind of be a quirk in and of itself. But yeah, I definitely think it's just something that we aren't supposed to think too much about. Like some things from early on in a series tend to be sometimes, unfortunately. How do you think Vigilantes will end and do you think it will cross over with the current My Hero Academia? How could you see it playing out? Also, do you think Koichi gets his quirk stolen? Originally, I thought he might die, but after doing a reread, he's narrating after the fact, so clearly he lives. Or do you think he ends up appearing in the main story at the end by saving someone, preferably Aizawa? I think within Vigilantes, uh, Koichi is going to have a happy ending and get away from the girl pretty much because Koichi having someone he loves in the hospital reminds me a lot of the situation that Knuckle Duster was in at the beginning of the series. And I think things will go differently for Koichi than they did for KD back then with what will ultimately, hopefully, be a happy ending. I can see Pop retiring from hero work after what happened, but I'd love to see her pursuing music and seeing any of her songs pop up in the main MHA manga. I think would be really cool or just like an album cover or something, right? With like her pigtails on it. But as far as Koichi, I'm honestly not too sure. I always kind of wanted Koichi to step up and take the steps to become an actual hero like any adult can outside of school like we learned in Vigilantes, but I kind of like the idea of him being the Vigilante of Naruhata, and I think if Vigilantes ends anytime soon, it would be nice to see him fighting off villains and random enemies in Naruhata as our characters pass through there for something or if Hori really wanted to work Viggs in, maybe something they need is there and they come across someone they weren't expecting because they're told that there's no heroes working in that area. I definitely think anytime Aiza was in danger someone is going to try to swoop in and save him and tend to sacrifice themselves but eventually that that is going to pay off in the other direction i think i think eventually Aizo is the person who's sacrificing himself to make sure that someone else can move forward so that that was what i was thinking was going to happen in the war arc but um especially with how important Aizo was but now we just have to be very careful that we don't lose him because his whole life he's been, he's had this example of people sacrificing themselves for him, right? To let him move forward. And narratively, that's for a purpose, right? Those people all did that so that Aizawa can do something in a very key moment or be there for a very key moment. And then, you know what I mean? Like it's up to Hori whether or not he's gonna continue the parallel by having Aizawa do that for someone else because generally that's what you'll have right like people will sacrifice themselves for you so that you could sacrifice yourself for someone else 
in the future because they're learning from their example. But we'll see. I mean, Aizawa definitely is the kind of person who would die for his students and die for a lot of different people. But again, they really, really need that quirk for what they're dealing with, right? Like shutting down Shigaraki's quirk with Aizawa's quirk, it, it was really helpful in the war arc and I don't know what they would do without him. So I guess if you're gonna have to have anyone save the day, hey, if Koichi's gonna have to die, you know, to really save the day, hopefully he gives Deku like an All Might hoodie that he doesn't have yet, or maybe they can trade one. I think that'd be really cool. But I guess I'm just getting really fan servicey at this point. And that also kind of demands that both of them survive at the end of the series and who knows how likely that is. If you could choose what Deku's last quirk is, what would you want it to be? I would either give him the ability to push and pull anything at a certain point in space at extreme speed or force thanks to one for all. Sort of like a really, really buff version of his mom's quirk that could sort of let him use his quirk pretty much like the force to kind of keep people in place and lock them down or move things and throw things at them as he tries to get closer to them again if they manage to avoid his other quirks and become a problem. Or the other idea I have that I really like is a simple mass and density quirk, where basically it's a quirk that lets Deku changes mass and density at will, meaning that he can make himself extremely heavy the moment that he lands a blow, or make himself extremely light to maximize his speed to a level unseen in the MHA universe, I think, so far. So either of those fit some stuff that I like about the other one for all quirks to a certain extent, because at the core they're really simple, but they have to be used in a smart way, especially given the power that they'd be boosted with thanks to one for all. Personal thoughts on how Deku's multiple quirks have been handled and what his final quirk could be. Now, as far as what I think his final quirk is, I think it's going to be some sort of projectile, clearly, right? As we can sort of gleam from the how the second was behaving in the flashback with the first, but I'm conflicted on what kind of projectile. Because with Shigaraki, we see that even stuff like a laser or energy would be easy for him to counter, but maybe with the experience that Deku has using Delaware smashes and maybe with some interesting kind of attributes like bouncy lasers or penetrating beams, it could be really effective. I, I, I don't really know. I know that's really not the most creative thing considering all the other one for all quirks or something that you could use to run away, which I mean, makes perfect sense since they were all running away from all for one for generations. But I think the second quirk specifically is going to be a much more offensive one given his nature and giving him rising against all for one right and even taking his brother away this guy led a force and battled the overlord himself right i, I would believe so he's definitely not someone to shrug off. And I'm hoping that if it isn't something like finger lasers, then it's at least something with an interesting aspect to it, right? Like, also whatever it is, I just wouldn't want to be hit by it, considering it was already probably pretty powerful when the second was alive, and now it'll be boosted by one for all. And it's the quirk that is probably the most boosted by one for all or something. Is that how it works? Because it's the oldest quirk in there. Who knows? Maybe I'm just like all for one and I see quirks like wine too. Controversial question you don't need to answer. What character have you disliked more and more as this series has gone on? Normal question, what type of ending do you think is the best for the following base-breaking characters? Dobby, NG, Katsuki, Hawks. You can do all or pick one. I probably have to say Mirio, I know that's not going to be a popular answer, but uh, Mirio went from being kind of like a shining star in my book to being sort of mishandled a little bit in my opinion. Like I haven't completely lost faith that he could be great again in the future, but the way that his return was handled at first kind of worked for me, but the more that I thought about it and talked about it with people, the angrier it made me. And it's like the thing with Horikoshi sometimes where some plot points with tons of buildup or really dramatic buildup get kind of muffled or kind of brushed off or jokey feeling conclusions to them, which are never really the true conclusion, I guess, since there's always a consequence or a reaction to every action that's taken in MHA, but yeah, I definitely think Mirio could have been handled a bit better in the war arc. If possible, I wouldn't have included them in the war arc at all, and I would have just had him out there right now. Like, as Deku was resting, I would have had Eri give him his quirk back now, and then we could have gotten like a short little Mirio side arc or something, right, where he's holding it down. And honestly, who wouldn't love that, as long as it, you know, obviously did continuously tie back to the main story that we're telling. That's just the sort of thing that happens in comics, I guess, and this series is a bit more focused, but it's just kind of unfortunate that Hori isn't really able to or doesn't really want to explore things like that that tie more closely back to MHA's comic book influences and their structure just a little bit more. I'm going to speed round those characters. What kind of ending do I think is best for Dobby? Death. NG Death. Katsuki, death. Let me be honest, I think my favorite ending for Bakugo would be something like him retiring <laughs> after being an amazing hero for all sorts of years, breaking records and stuff, selling action figures, you know, having horrible like reviews, him just retiring out in the mountains and running like a hot spring business or something, right? Like something like that would be really cool. I don't know, something kind of laid back, but also it's still fiery. It's still kind of like he gets pissed at customers. So like that. I don't know, That that's how I could see him and his life kind of closing out. Hawks, 
dead. And for Hawks, I really think uh, him losing his wings would probably be one of the best things. Uh, I think that Hawks being the character who technically has the most freedom, right? Who he can fly around, he, he can listen to everything, he can be in all these places, he can use his wings in this really creative, like, free way. I think him being caged, right, by the Hero Society has, is really unfortunate. But him not having wings and him not being a hero is one way that he could be free from that entirely, right? Like, him just being a normal guy, right? Just just a guy with free time who isn't hangs out with Endeavor, who hangs out with, like, oh, well, I guess not, because Endeavor's going to be dead. So, sad. Do you think Deku ends my hero with a quirk? Will it be one for all? I think he might end the series how he started it, honestly, with no quirk. But I think the journey of Quirkless to one for all to Quirkless again is going to be like a remarkable tale in universe that would compel anyone to pretty much behave as Deku has behaved and try to follow his example of bringing people together and sharing the responsibility of saving everyone with not just the heroes who physically save them at times, but the village who has to mentally and emotionally be there for them as well. Everyone shares responsibility, and it's sort of just kind of like one for all itself. It's all about sharing, while all for one is trying to snatch that unity away in place of his own manufactured and controlled reality. Do you think Tampico tastes bad? No, Tampico is better than Hawaiian Punch, specifically for some reason, that's what I'm going to call out. And there's an argument to be made that Pink Tampico is better than any Sunny D, even Tropical. Try with ice, y'all, seriously. What's your favorite quirk in all of my hero? Is saying all for one cheating, since it would kind of give me access to everyone's quirks, technically? I mean, I, I guess saying that kind of reveals that I'd be a villain if I had that quirk. So instead, I'll say my favorite has to be Star and Stripes quirk, which might be recency bias, but I could think of a million ways to use that quirk that would just be really awesome. But I'd probably have to say for a very long time, it has been Dark Shadow, because Tokoyami's quirk is just really damn awesome. And anytime we see Tokoyami again after he's had some downtime in the background, I get really hyped at seeing what Dark Shadow is going to bust out or what they've learned. And to be honest, I legit would read an entire Tokoyami manga. Like, comment below if you would too, and let's just get it made somehow. Let's, let's figure it out. If Shigaraki post-MVA and pre-PLW and Overhaul were to fight each other, who would win? I think this would be an extremely hard fight for both of them to a certain extent, right? Like, I'm sure power scalers or someone would say something about speed or blitzing or blah blah blah, but at the end of the day, on a quirk v quirk standpoint, and knowing how the users fight, as well as how they use their quirks, I think Overhaul would have an extremely dangerous fight on his hands, because anything that he tries to use against Shigaraki is going to be decayed, and he has to be touching something to overhaul it. And of course, at the end of the day, decay would lead back to him if it was quick enough. Now, if Chisaki could somehow separate himself enough from the earth or whatever he's using to try and fight Shigaraki, then maybe he can find some way to close in and turn Shigaraki into a blood pool. But I think by the end of MVA, if we're disregarding the injuries that Shiggy got from the Redestro fight and just putting these two at full health, no limb damage or anything like that and had them fight, I don't think the edge goes to overhaul because more times out of 10, I think Shigaraki just kind of goes berserk and shatters everything overhaul tries to throw at him to the point where overhaul is going to try to reach and morph something to defend themselves or fuse or attack. And there's not going to be anything there but dust and smoke. I think Overhaul is definitely holding tons of untapped potential just because the power of fusion is so interesting in My Hero Academia, and he's the only one we've seen capable of doing that besides, like, theoretically, maybe Toga, who could get a sort of similar effect by copying you and going half seas with it, I guess, if you want to be technical. But without his hands, I don't see him ever being relevant as a threat ever again in the series. And even if he can somehow use his quirk of his hands or his feet, I don't know if he could do it with nearly the same accuracy as he could when he still had working hands. So I think that's probably what keeps him from healing himself, despite the fact that like ultra analysis or something apparently clues us in that his quirk is somewhat acclimated to his body, apparently. Or was that a thing? Or was that a thing? Honestly, we really need the English translation of that before I kind of go off more than I already have. And I think I'm going a little off topic. So next question. But one last thing I will say is what would happen if like Shigaraki and Chisaki both like smacked hands at each other and tried to use their quirks on each other? Who would destroy who, right? Like would Chisaki destroy over, uh, would Overhaul destroy Shigaraki's hand or would Shigaraki destroy Overhaul's hand first? I feel like that, that'd be an interesting question for like, Horikoshi to answer, actually. What will you focus on when MHA ends? It hurts to say. Uh, I have a rotation of series that I talk about, and generally it seems like people are comfortable with me discussing other manga and anime besides MHA, even though I'm sure that's where the majority of my audience is. So I think after MHA ends, I'll just keep talking about the things that I like as I get animated, while also exploring some other stuff in life, hopefully with the newfound time from not having to theorize about Aoyama being the traitor or dad for one being real all day. 
I do have some interesting video series and stuff that I'm planning right now and that I'm doing that aren't all entirely tied to one series. So you're gonna be seeing a lot of different stuff I'll say on the channel soon. But I mean, I started off as like a Narutuber a long time ago, so I'm really not all that worried about my hero ending or anything like that. There's always gonna be something else that you love that you can find a way to talk about. One more if you have time. Do you think Horikoshi made a mistake having so many characters in his story that it's hard for the average casual audience to be attached to them? Or do you think he does a good enough job trying to separate the important characters from the rest? I think it's just down to expectations versus how Hori writes his work. It doesn't seem like Hori intended for it to go like some other series where each and every character is slowly focused on in a big way and everyone kind of has to have an important big tie-in like the Avengers movies or something like that. Everyone has some attention paid to them, but Hori really smartly picks the ones who fit his themes or his causes the most at any given time and puts a magnifying glass on them in a way that always seems to work. And I feel like it was thought out for a lot of them from the very beginning. I think the problem is just that the ones that he decides to focus on aren't always the ones that people would necessarily like him to. And people's expectations are always gonna be, well, you introduce all these students, this is the rival, this is, you know, these are all these people. So now you have to have individual arcs for all of them. When really the class itself is a character that represents the unity between heroes and society and how all the heroes are learning from the civilian who somehow became a hero and had a lot to teach them about how to do it correctly. Just how 1A learns from Deku and before him All Might, in this arc we saw society learning from them, which means that the lessons that Deku's taught his class from leading by example and always being helpful and supportive and the lessons that they reminded him of about being able to take help not only give it are gonna spread through society and create a better future. One where people are inspired to be like Deku and his peers who taught them to never ignore someone or send them away because dealing with it would be hard or you think it's someone else's problem. Someone in need is everybody's problem and we needed to see class 1A students growing and being there for each other and being close for this payoff of Deku and society to hit as hard as it did when he was let back into the school. And it's wonderful in my opinion because I've always thought that defeating Shigaraki in All for One isn't enough. To truly be successful, Deku has to change society itself somehow, and I never really knew how exactly he would do that, right? Like, because just taking care of everything by himself like All Might would have just made everyone rely on him in a dangerous way again. But now it's clear to me that his lesson and the lesson of his peers is spreading, and Deku's way, after being set straight by his classmates, will become the way that people behave and think moving forward after this crisis, when remembering all it takes to avoid another one is just caring and stepping up. So folks, those have been the questions for this Q&A section of My Hero Academia. Those were Twitter questions. And if you want to drop some questions down in the comment section below, I would love, honestly, to compile a bunch of them and answer the most interesting ones. Maybe we can make this a more common thing, or you guys can let me know if you want to talk about a different series or if you just don't want me to do any more Q&As at all. Really interested in hearing your thoughts. My outline for What If Tenko Shimura is finished, and boy... Oh, I had some crazy brainstorming and it got really interesting. I, I definitely changed my initial idea for it and it is, it's going to be really great. So I hope that comes out very soon for you guys. If not, there'll definitely be something to keep you busy until then. But if you would like that YouTube comment section Q&A, please get this video to a thousand likes and that'll let me know in a big way how you guys feel about it. So this is Pineapple. I'll see you guys later. I love you. Peace.